It is noon on Wednesday, February 2nd. We'll Groundhog few... Day. Ooh, Groundhog Day. Day, yes. I hear that the groundhog saw his shadow too. Oh, so really? We have six more weeks of winter, apparently, yes. We have two Pennsylvania girls on this call with you, Brad. So yeah. we pay attention to Punxsutawney Phil. That's right. you know, I saw a national, while we're waiting for folks to populate in, I saw a National Weather Service tweet, though, that, that Punxsutawney Tony Phil has only been right 40% of the time, according to the National Weather Service. It does I mean, data surprise. doesn't matter, Brad. <laughs> <laughs> and now with that comment, Yanni, let's start today's webinar. So hi, everybody. Great. Welcome to our Academic Leaders webinar uh, at noon on Wednesday. Thank you so much for joining us today. I've got a few housekeeping things right here at the beginning. Um, that I want to uh, let people know about. Uh, for those of you that have joined us before on these webinars, you know that there's closed captioning available for our webinars. Uh, go ahead and click the closed captioning on the bottom of the screen in order to see this. We also run these webinars in Zoom webinar mode. So we don't use the chat for questions. Instead, we use the Q&A feature. My guess is that all of you are gonna have some wonderful questions for Anne and Yanni today as we jump into our conversation. And so, uh, please feel free to use the Q&A feature there. I'll be monitoring that as the conversation goes along uh, and posing the questions as we can. I am joined today by two great friends and colleagues, Yanni Hill-Gill, uh, the president of ADVIS, the Association of Delaware Valley Independent Schools, uh, and Ann Klotz, the head of school of Laurel School in Shaker Heights, Ohio. Hi, Ann and Yanni. Hello. So good hey, to have you. Today, we get to talk about how to be an empathetic leader without burning out. Um, and I want to remind folks that on our blog, uh, we have a wonderful blog post about managing compassion fatigue that Liz Cates wrote. Um, and next week's webinar is some big news that we have coming at One Schoolhouse. We're excited to share with you uh, that. We also have currently going on our call for teachers. If you're interested in being an online teacher with One Schoolhouse next year, uh, our call for teachers is currently open. We've released our 22-23 student course catalog and registration is now open for that. And this week on our newsletter, we asked where folks were on a burnout scale. So Yanni and Anne, I'd love to start our conversation with this. So we've asked this question before. We asked it in October, 2020, and you all remember what October of 2020 was like. Holy yes. cow. Yes, we I were do. felt like, you know, we were hybrid school. We were kind of like some kids online, some kids offline. Like it yeah. was just the height of insanity. And at that point, 23% of respondents said that they were completely burned out. Mm. What's crazy is that's exactly what the percentage is right now too. And then moderate burnout is pretty close to the same too. Does this surprise you? Does this worry you? What, you know, what, what's the emotion maybe that comes off of this? Um, it doesn't surprise me. Um, I don't know about you, Ann, but, um, you know, I'm not in a school this year, but I certainly have been in schools. And I was certainly in a school last year when that October data comes out. But what I'm hearing from my friends who are um, in schools is that this year, um, there's just everyone's tired and there's a lack of, you know, patience and a high level of frustration. Um, whereas last year, you know, people were sort of willing to kind of be with you a little bit and figure it out and give you a little grace because we were all in it together. We were trying, you know, different things. And I think now everyone's done with that. So I'm not surprised about that. What, do you, what about you, Anne? I think very much the same, Yanni. I was thinking about, um, you know, last year we were so full of hope for the vaccine mm -hmm. and sort of everybody just trying to get along to February. We got our whole faculty and staff vaccinated, um, I don't know, towards the end of February and then got our booster right before spring break. I think we came back to the school year sort of energized yeah. and excited. We felt um, we could be without masks outside. We felt less worried about distance. We were letting kids, you know, eat in school because sometimes they do need to eat. Uh, and then when Omicron surged, I feel like it was like a bad version of a slingshot, just yeah. taking <laughs> us back actually yeah. further than we've been at the beginning yep. because we had this fantasy that we were all going to be okay. And moving um, forward, yeah. We had... Maybe we had 95% of our upper school boosted, I mean, upper school vaccinated. But then when the CDC said you weren't fully vaccinated unless you had a booster, it dropped, it plummeted. And mm. I think the, the fatigue of COVID cannot be underestimated. And I agree with Yanni. 
uh, you know, the parents at Laurel School, by and large, are a remarkably fabulous group of humans. Mm -hmm. But I will say that I think everyone's patience is tested. And last year, everybody was willing to say, oh, gosh, we're all in this together. And I think we all feel now a little more frayed, F-R-A-Y-E-D. So uh, more sort of a uh, what can you do for me lately mentality, yeah. then I think the emergency and the crisis of COVID brought out the best in everybody in the school. We've yeah. also seen many more cases of Omicron in our yeah. fully yeah. vaccinated and boosted faculty and staff. I have hired three full-time substitutes. Mm, I was wow. lucky I found them um, and got them into this building every day to just take a little bit of pressure off of our faculty and staff. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's it it it, it is uh, it it is feeling like burnout on top of burnout on top of burnout, which was yeah. the title of an article on Vox this weekend, right? right. Like mm -hmm. you get past one thing, and then all of a sudden you get back. You get past the next thing, all of a sudden you get back, and and these glimmers of hope that we get almost almost continue to create more challenges. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, Brad, to that point, you know, I have a life in the theater before I became a head of school and the two are not dissimilar, but <laughs> when you're doing, when you're prepping for a play and you know, you have tech week and it's going to be super intense and you're going to work really, really hard. And then you're going to have the production and then you're going to recover. I, I think part of the, the Vox article I found so depressing, I could hardly even finish it uh, because I think it's true. And so the problem for me with leading the school through a global pandemic that kind of feels like the song, you know, lamb chops, this is the song that never ends, it goes mm -hmm. on and on my friends, is that we don't know, we can't Correct. look in a crystal ball and say, okay, uh, we know by, you know, April of 2023, we're all going to be past that. And if yeah. we did know that we would adjust our expectations accordingly. So that's where I think that idea of the reverse slingshot, it definitely feels harder. Um, and hard on top of other things that are hard. You know, we're all trying to continue to move forward, to be innovative, to yeah. be um, nimble, to respond to other um, issues in our schools, whether that's really looking hard at uh, race and culture and belonging, or in some of our girls' schools, really thinking about how we're both and schools mm -hmm. with kids who are in different places along a gender spectrum. I mean, there's a lot going on. There's a and lot. And then there's a global pandemic. Correct. So let's talk about how uh, we, we know it's super important for leaders to recharge um, and to really recharge, not, not just to take a vacation, right? But to actually really recharge. So, what are some of the things that you are doing yourself as a leader to recharge? And how are you encouraging those on your leadership teams? Um, and Yanni, in the case of the, of the school leaders that you work with across uh, across the association to really recharge. Yeah, you know, I, again, I, I think we spend some time um, really in conversation with our school leaders um, in my role now as Advis and, you know, kind of posing those questions and providing opportunities, right? I mean, that's our role now is how do we provide, you know, opportunities for folks to connect um, safely, whether it be virtually or in small groups. Um, some of it is, you know, to learn, but a lot of it is to do that connection and letting your hair down and kind of, you know, um, being together and um, being able to express what you're going through at that particular time with no judgment. Yep. Um, I think that's important. Um, in terms of, you know, myself and my team, uh, we're, we're all virtual. Uh, so I think that allows some, a lot of flexibility, which yep. you don't have in the school, right? So even in my tenure last year, uh, while I was finishing up as head, um, and we were in the midst of the pandemic, you really giving your team permission to take that flexibility, um, I think is huge. You know, as a leader setting that expectation for me personally, I'd say between four and six, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not available. Mm. Um, sometimes I would, you know, exercise. Sometimes I'd go get a massage. Sometimes I'd cook a meal, whatever it is that I thought I needed at that particular time to take care of myself was really critical. And then being able to um, feel like I could take care of others and, and you know, in the school at hand really was helpful. You know, I think Brad and Ann about um, this concept that um, a, a pastor of mine told me years ago is that, you know, you um, reap what you sow. 
um, but you also um, reap um, after you sow and you also reap more than you sow. Mm -hmm. And so it's really important that you sow, right? At the you know beginning of your day, each day, what sows you, know, you? Like, what are you going to do to feed you? And then that way you can feed others. So I've always had that sort of concept um, in, my, in my head. And I, I really, really relied on that last year. And I continue this year. I've been through a lot of challenges um, beyond moving and into a new job, but a lot of personal things. And I've had to really, you know, anchor around that. Hmm. Hmm. I made a little list um, and I don't know how comprehensive it is, but the first thing I realized is that we were blurring school and home way too yeah. much in school, particularly because of the pandemic. So so without telling anyone, although now I'm going to disclose it to the world, uh, I stopped emailing anybody connected to school over the weekend. Uh, mm. And over, over the course of the year, it's become a norm for us. So that actually, if there's an emergency, you text. Mm, but yep. it's cut down on everybody. You know, I know when the head of school emails, people feel obliged to answer it. So yep. that's one small thing I've tried to do for the whole school. Um, I have a text chain that Yanni's on with a bunch of women head friends of mine. That is a source of hilarity, compassion, empathy, and it's a group of women who all understand what we are doing. So that has been, it sort of grew up uh, actually after the pandemic, we were doing a lot of Zooms, then yeah. we got Zoom fatigue. So now we just do texts with funny emojis and sometimes really serious issues, but sometimes just silly things that will raise our collective spirits. Um, I, when you talk about a real ability to recharge, Brad, I don't know that I've had that yet since mm. the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, if the fates go well, I'll spend a week in Ireland at the end of July. I'm working on an MFA in creative nonfiction. And I did that because I knew if I didn't carve out some time for me, uh, COVID would swallow me whole. I was yeah. going to say, you did that before, You did that in the pandemic. I did it right you? in yeah. July of 2020. Yeah. And, wow. you know, what a silly time to say I was going to do an MFA. But <laughs> it has actually been really a time for Anne. The mm. other thing is I have this great finger puppet that I'm showing to America um, that one of my advisees made. And I just entertained some of our early learners with her um, a few minutes ago. And I find if I can, I guess this is sort of about sewing, um, Yanni, if I can make time every day yep. to walk among children, yep. um, it lifts my spirits. I teach. I've always been a teaching head. My ninth graders just cracked me up yesterday. Mm -hmm. And I have been terrible at correcting their papers this week. But boy, did we laugh a lot. And so that reminds me of why it is I do what I do with all these silly COVID protocols. And then I'll tell you two quick things. One is I read and I read fiction uh, for pleasure. And I read every night, no matter what, unless I fall asleep before I read. Um, uh, my son, who is 17, um, said last week, he's just back from the mountain school. And he said, mom, you do so much. Um, Daddy and I have decided to surprise you. We've gotten a food subscription mm -hmm. and we are going to try and cook dinner a few times a week. And I just burst out laughing because first of all, I can't wait to see it happen. And second of all, I'm excited <laughs> that sometimes I love to cook, but if I get home at 6.30 and have to think then about feeding my family, it's just too much. Mm -hmm. So that felt like a real gift from them. And I think it's their recognizing the level of stress that I am under. And like many school leaders, I behave really well at school. Um, I am paid to do so. And sometimes I go home and feel like I take it out on the people who love me the most. Yeah. I'm a big fan of naps. Uh, and there's this famous story in the archives of one of the headmistresses association of this woman who led her school in the 30s. And she said she always took a two hour nap every afternoon. I have not been able to figure that out. No. But on weekends, I sometimes just go upstairs, close the door. And for me, a nap is often about reading a novel. I would like a two hour nap. I don't know. There's something, I know, there's right? something about that. I think we need to take that advice. As heads of schools and leaders of organizations, you're often looking at your past to have great ideas for the future. So there's That's a great right. idea for the future that we can take from the headmistresses yeah. association from the past. Right. <laughs> you know, let's let's focus on a couple of ideas that you all brought up there because there are some real similarities there. One one thing that you both kind of touched on there is that a, as a school leader, whether it's a head of school, whether it's a division director, whether it's department chair, you're often the island of one. Yep. Right. You're the one of within your building. You're the one head of school. You're the one math department chair. You're the one academic dean. Um, and so that connection across to like minded peers becomes super important in times of pressure and stress, doesn't it? 
Mm -hmm. Oh, so I'll just speak a little bit to, you know, Cleveland is a highly competitive, saturated independent school market. And I have never been more grateful for my colleagues at University School and Hawkins School and, and Hathaway Brown School and Gilmore. We have really made an incredible effort to stay connected through the pandemic on our protocols. We have the Cleveland Council of Independent Schools. Our executive director has done a great job assembling us, bringing medical experts to us. And also just about half an hour ago, we all called a collective snow day. Don't tell anyone, we haven't told the children yet. Uh, but those ideas of um, really reaching out to one another is critically important, particularly in these moments. So we're not lonely. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I I really echo that too, and I cannot um, imagine what my life would have been like last year and even this year if I didn't have, you know, my peeps and my folks. Uh, and to your point, even in a flooded market, right at the beginning of the pandemic, I was in Atlanta, and the Atlanta heads, without really sort of any organization of a group or an association, just said, "We got to talk," and we would look forward to those Monday calls of like, "We don't know what we're doing. Um, who's helping us?" Our medical team is saying this, your medical team is saying that, you know, the board is saying this, and it just was really, really comforting to know you were not in it alone. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's true even going forward. It's been true in the past before COVID, but it's been so critical, critically important and more important now. And I'll yeah. throw out one more thing, which is um, I am, I know this will sound like a plug and I don't mean it to, I'm really grateful for, uh, for instance, the academic leaders listserv at one schoolhouse. Mm -hmm. I am grateful to read and NIS does a lovely listserv for heads, Isaacs, all the organizations. Sometimes I get listserv saturated, yeah. but every so often, and I, I try not to beat myself up that I'm not reading everything religiously. There's no way that I could keep no up way. with everything that comes across my desk. But it is sometimes tremendously reassuring to read that somebody else is managing something that we're thinking about yeah. at Laurel School. And that professional collegiality, uh, I have always found in independent schools sort of comforting and um, kind of terrific. And that we do have lots and lots of ability to connect with one another, to think through something. And we don't have to reinvent the wheel all by ourselves mm -hmm. if we're smart enough to remember that there are other smart people who are thinking with us about topics. Mm -hmm. And that's also how we forge new relationships, which is so great for our schools. There's no server lining that's come out of the pandemic, but our schools have learned how to collaborate with each other, even in hyper-competitive markets, of which right, both yeah. of you are in right now too, right? right? I mean, Yanni, you yep. see this certainly in the Philadelphia Def area. Yes, definitely. We're, we're, working, we're working together in a, in a much more cohesive way, which is, which is really wonderful. Another idea that both of you hit on there is um, giving yourself permission and giving others permission uh, and giving others permission to set boundaries. Mm -hmm. Right. Right, like uh, making Yanni. I loved your example of four to six. That's a boundary that you're setting. And your your example of you know I'm not emailing over the weekend because if I start emailing, then my whole team's going to start emailing. That sets a new norm. Yeah. As leaders, you've got to think really carefully and clearly about the boundaries that you're setting for yourself, and then what that means for your team's permission to set those boundaries for them. Yeah. And yeah, go ahead. Nancy. No, I was just going to say, and I think that's even more important as a woman leader, right? Mm -hmm. Because our tendency is to sort of go above and beyond and care for everyone, but really to set the tone. If you're going to be an empathetic leader, you have to have some empathy for yourself, yeah. right? It's not sacrificing your needs and your wants, you know, over other people. And that's tends sometimes to be the pattern of women. So I think it's really critical for us to be able to, to sort of do that. And, and the other piece I'll just add on to that is the psychological and social and emotional well-being, not just of the children in our care, but of the faculty and staff in yes. our care. So yes. at Laurel, we're really lucky to have an incredible team of consulting psychologists and a full-time school psychologist. And in my weekly letter that I write to our faculty and staff, you know, several times times we have put in again their availability to meet with people you yeah. know people have lost family members people have lost jobs there's just so much going on and so the pastoral piece of school leadership which I'm not sure anyone really prepares you for is making sure that we are um, interested in and caring about our our adult community as well as our children. Um, I have tried to really avoid what I call toxic positivity mm. because I think while I am generally a pretty optimistic person, I think it's tone deaf if I am bouncing around the school uh, sort of tra-la-tra-la -la when people often feel 
um, that what we're asked to do right now is is really challenging. And so yeah. I'm trying to make sure I'm taking time to to say how how are things with your family and how is that new pandemic puppy that seemed like such a good idea at the time? Uh, but to remember that human touch and mm -hmm. to be human in my own interactions with people, even in hard interactions, uh, to remember people's dignity and to be deeply respectful and kind. Mm -hmm. There's a level of vulnerability that I think the the pandemic has um, unveiled for all of us. The uncertainty of it, um, and I think you know, last year and certainly you know the tail the beginning of 2020, that was the case. You, you know, I mean, for me personally, right in March of 2020, I lost two aunts to COVID, and I you know I found out in the midst of a finance committee call. Um, and I was on Zoom and I had to, you know, really be vulnerable with the board um, and, you know, shut down a little bit of so we could process together. And I think that's important to carry through, right? That that love, that sense of vulnerability and that we're all in this together. But I'm willing to share some of the things I'm going through as a leader because we don't always got it all together, although we're leading these schools and organizations. Boy, that just gives permission right there, right? Yeah. You know, we don't always have this all together, even if it looks like we might. That's we don't right. always have it all together. Yeah. And we got to use humor. Yeah. Not, not in a sassy way, but we just have to, like, if humor goes, we're all sunk. We have <laughs> got to somehow look for the things that can still make us laugh, like my duck finger puppet, which right. XYZ made for me and has boosted my spirits today. And we're going to have you back on this webinar once you have uh, finger puppets. <laughs> I'm, I'll be ready, we're Brad. Expect I'll a be long ready. Show. So, uh, <laughs> you know, one thing that we know helps with senses of burnout is uh, is is purpose and meaning. Mm. And this is a place where mission-based schools um, really do have an advantage. Um, we, we know and are clear in our schools uh, what our mission is, what we're trying to achieve, and that can help us in these situations where we might feel burnout. I wonder if, if you have any thoughts in, in those areas and how school leaders can lean into those purposes right now. So we are working hard on a strategic plan at Laurel School. And one of the wonderful opportunities that a strategic plan gives a school every several years or several years uh, is really to tie everything we're thinking about back to mission and values mm -hmm. and to be very explicit. One of my um, mantras for this year has been to make the implicit explicit. Mm -hmm. And I don't think as a math student, I always wanted to show my work. I just wanted to get to the answer. As a leader this year, I have really focused on trying to be certain that I am making what's in my head more explicit for my faculty, my staff, my parents, my board, uh, alums, um, because it all ties back to mission and uh, values. Mm -hmm. And at Laurel, we're about inspiring each girl to fulfill her promise and to better the world. And I feel really lucky. I got to actually be part of the authorship of that mission. And so it feels really resonant to me. Mm -hmm. um, and it feels natural to say, is this decision that we're making in furtherance of the mission or contradicting the mission? And if it's contradicting, it's gotta go. And also we cannot be all things to all people. Right. And we have to be really brave about that. Yep. Even in a highly competitive market. No, I'm sorry, we don't offer whatever it is, and we're not gonna start right. um, because these are the things that tie back to our mission. Yeah, I love that, Anne, and I think that's critical for schools and their, you know, sustainability and their ability to thrive. You know, at Avis, that's something that we're really pushing is that in the midst of all of this, you know, chaos and the reactionary, you know, sort of um, pieces to the job is that we create some opportunity to folks to do just that, Anne, right, to think about what it could be um, and what you've done and take those lessons from there and, and really hone down on the purpose and the mission and, you know, things that you could do differently and be innovative. So I think there's some great opportunity for our schools in that. And the pandemic, I, I am not the first person to say this, and I can't attribute it because I don't, can't remember where I read it first. It might have been you, Brad. The pandemic was an accelerant for independent wow. schools, right? Yeah. And so um, what we learned is we could do things faster than mm -hmm. we actually thought we could. 
childhood. Mm -hmm. That I moved a division of my school, uh, grades four and five are now their own division out to our Butler campus, which is this beautiful natural uh, space. Uh, if you had said to me, well, Anne, how many years would it take? I would yeah. have said, well, we'll have to backwards design and yeah. you know, we'll have to do. Uh, and, and you know what? We just did it because did it, yeah. we had a pandemic and we didn't have enough elbow room. And so boom. And mm -hmm. sometimes I think that opportunity, uh, if we weren't so darn tired, we could relish um, sort of the yes. triumph of the ways we've done things differently. And mm. I keep trying to remind our board and remind our faculty and staff of look what we've done. Yes. Um, and I think as the leader, I always am seeing the hills yet to climb. Sometimes it's my wise husband who says, I also want you to stand and look back at all the summits you've achieved. That's right. And that I think is so important, that opportunity to reflect. Perfect. Boy, that's, that's huge, isn't it? Helping mm -hmm. our community see the path that we've been on because that path has been incredible over the last couple mm -hmm. of years. And we were about to hit that two year anniversary of, yep. of when we all started to get into this. My and goodness. We thought it would be a couple of weeks, remember? That's right, that's right. <laughs> and so, so thinking about how we can present to our communities the successes that we've had within that mm -hmm. two year period rather than uh, without doing so in a toxically positive way, right? Anne, right? Which is the challenge here. <laughs> But, but there are so many successes that we've had and so many things that we have been accelerated at within our schools. Hmm. Um, folks, if you have a question, we have a couple of minutes left for uh, Ann and Yanni. Please, please feel free to put that into the Q&A uh, area as well. Um, we've talked about this a little bit, but um, uh, I'd love to kind of refocus on the connection that you've had with others and the ways that we relied upon networks for support as we've gone through. Um, and you talked about some formal or informal networks that you've created as well. And Yanni, I know that Avis just continues to create formal networks too for people to, uh, to feel connected to each other. That's true, yeah. So, you know, whether it be our um, round tables for different folks like, you know, upper school, middle school division directors or, you know, um, deans of students, et cetera, and it's virtual still, but um, there's a there's a um, comfort for those folks to know that that round table is going to exist, right? And that they can get there and, you know, ask their question or go to the breakout room for whatever topic. So I think that's, that's you know, significant as well. And that's, you know, it's formal, but it's informal. And that's sort of our challenge is to make sure what we're offering is a balance of both. It's sort of the, you know, formal direct, you know, learning, um, but also an opportunity for folks to connect and still learn from each other, right, in a very informal way. I, I think, um, again, I think about the, for, the organizations to which many of us belong, one schoolhouse, of course, leader of the pack, but yep. how much um, organizations have tried to up their game in terms of fostering opportunities for connection and how appreciative I am of that. Uh, I think our parents in our schools long for connection and because we're not doing as many in-person things, that has felt actually more trying to me than mm. my professional networks where I can jump on a Zoom or text someone and say, hey, you have five minutes. Um, and uh, of course, I think the kids are the most resilient of all. And while there'll be many, many years before we see what the impact is on this odd way, you know, little ones who've been born and only seen people from the no bridge of the nose up, uh, you know, I think they're extraordinary. And we have to also remind them that we're really proud of the way they're coming to school and taking on a whole host of different challenges and remind ourselves and our faculty and staff. Um, and again, I think in independent schools, um, it's okay to demand the best uh, of one another, but it's also fatiguing. Yeah. And we wanna make sure we're finding that line between responsiveness and also just saying thank you, gratitude. I think that is a great place to end. Mm -hmm. uh, Anne and Yanni, thank you so much. We will make sure to have you back on one of these webinars in the future. And I hope uh, everybody that's been watching has also gotten a chance to laugh a little bit here too at the lunchtime hour with us. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye. Good Anne. to see everyone. Thanks, Bye. Fred. Bye, Anne. <laughs> Bye, Yanni. I love you. Love you too. <laughs>